Good morning. Father, we just welcome you here this morning. Just like we were just singing from the head to the toe, Father, all of you be in all of us today. Lord, we just declare this meeting is set apart to gather in your name and to glorify your name. Father, that we want to grow in the ways that you created us to be. And I just pray, Father, for those that are here, those that are watching by stream, those that are connected in the replay of this service, I just thank you, God, that they were connected by one spirit, that's your Holy Spirit. We decree that today. Be with the worship team, Father, as they worship for us and with us. Father, we, we exalt your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, say hi to two or three of the people this morning. Welcome them here this morning. And say from the head to the toe, he's all over you. All right, declare that.
this morning, we just focus our attention on you, Father. We want to get lost in you today, God. There's no, we just say there's no shame in us about worshiping you, about living for you, God. We want to touch your heart right now, Father. We just say that this time is all about you. It's devoted all to you. We just want to get lost in you, God.
this state is an open space. God, please come and have your way. We're open. We are open. And this nation is an open space. God, please come.
space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. And I'm open. I just want to say this because uh, Steve just came over before they sang this and he saw a golden key in the room and uh, just moving about and it's, it's, you know, keys are authority and they open up things for us, but in the Hebrew, the word key means opener. And uh, that's just what they were singing about. And it means to open, to begin to plow and to carve and begin to break through. So I just want to, if we're in open space for the Lord, the key is here this morning to plow into your heart, to carve out, to bring breakthrough in your heart today if we're just that open space. So I just want to just take a moment there. She was repenting about anything we've done. Uh, I think that breaks something, but we want to allow that key to open our heart. It's here to help us. It's not here as just a sign, uh, you know, to say, hey, wow, we have signs in our meeting. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a helper. And the Lord has brought it here today to open our hearts. And so, Father, we just surrender to this key that you sent the gold, Lord, the, the beauty, the, the thing that's refined by fire, uh, that would open our hearts and to carve into us and to break through our hearts so that we can walk in this place where we are an open space, that you can tell us what to do and what to say, and we would just be obedient to those voices and enjoy an abundant life that comes from walking in that place with you. So we just received this prophetically this morning. I think each one of you just need to receive that prophetically, that you would open for that. I really felt like the Lord said today that um, he really wanted to bring the, the mystical into the tangible. And I just felt like the Lord said today is a day where you can begin to ask for something that's tangible. It's a day where you can ask for signs. You know, when Gideon had a few victories under his belt, the Lord still was telling him he was going to be a deliverer of Israel. And he said he asked for a fleece. And he said, Lord, don't be mad. I asked for a sign. I'm asking, I'm asking for this. Don't be mad. I'm asking for it again. And I really felt like the Lord said there's a grace. There's some where you've just been, it seems like you've been walking in a fog lately. It feels like you just want to leave everything that you've even been called to do. And the Lord says, ask me for a sign. Ask me for something that's tangible. It's not something, it's not another word from somebody. It's something that's tangible that is that is a reality. And, and I'll share two quick testimonies. I remember uh, a while back I was going to go to school. And uh, I didn't really quite feel right about going to, going to school and pursuing a career uh, in computers, ironically, uh, which I really don't know that much about now because I didn't go to school. But um, I, I didn't quite feel right about it. And I remember my sister and I had a conversation. She said, ask the Lord for a sign. So I said, Lord, I was like, I don't have a job right now. I'm just going to go to school because it's the best thing I know to do, right? It's a practical thing. And I said, if you've got, if you've got, uh, if you've got something else for me, 
I said, I'm not going to wait on this. I'm going to keep, I'm going to make a step. I said, in two days, I said, call, have somebody call me up and offer me a job. And within two days, I had two people that called and offered me up a job, offered me a job so I didn't go to school. That was my sign that I wasn't supposed to go in that direction. I'm not saying you have to put two days on it. I remember I had a young man one time that was asking, he was struggling whether God, if God was real or not. And he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, I want a sign that you're real. And he goes to sleep that night and has a dream. And in the dream, he's driving down the road. There's a big, huge interstate sign that says, how's this? And when he woke up from the dream, he knew that was a sign. It was a literal sign in the dream. But the Lord wants to do that here this morning. He wants to lift that fog off of that, that thing that just says, man, I don't even feel like doing this anymore. Is this really even a reality? The Lord says that. It, you know, it may, and when I say tangible, it's not okay. It's, you need money for something. Ask for money. I had a friend who's, uh, who's fairly well off and had some medical expenses and things like that pop up. He, and he just started having checks come in the mail from all these different things um, that he didn't even know. And when I say checks, I'm talking about like thousands of dollars. Like it was encouraging to hear that. Uh, so, yeah. So, Father, we just thank you for the tangible this morning, Lord. We just thank you. Lord, for the things that you've spoken to us in the spirit realm, Lord, and we, uh, Lord, we just open up, Lord, the, the key here this morning is to open up those reality, Lord, of things we can handle and touch. Lord, just like you, you said in John, Lord, where it says, we proclaim to you what we have seen, what we have handled, and we have touched. This morning, we're just asking for stuff that you just touch, Lord. It's tangible, Lord. It's a, it's a testimony, Lord, of your goodness. We just thank you for that right now, for your glory, Lord. We just ask right now that there would be, a, if it's open in the spirit realm, that signs about directions we can go and decisions we can make, even who comes with us in those things right now, is open this morning. Thank you for that, Father. I just want to break off false humility because you feel like you shouldn't have to ask for a sign. <laughs> you feel like you've been in the kingdom long enough, you should know the answer to issues in life and sometimes you just don't know what to do and you it's okay to ask for this sign i i don't know how to explain that I, there's a surrender place we have to come to the lord and we just say god i i just don't know what to do and i need a sign from you and so lord i just want to break false humility off anybody in this room here today that you've struggled with that that you just feel like you're a failure and your faith because you didn't have the, the, the wherewithal to have the answers to life and you needed a sign and you're it's pride I'm telling you I just break a spirit of pride that says you can't ask for one and that you think you've been in, in this thing long enough that you shouldn't have to ask for. I break that I'm one of these I'm, I'm repenting for myself and I just say God I repent And it is a biblical way, even though there's other ways, it's still a biblical way. And we decree that, Father, we are not failures, and we humble ourselves. And we repent for pride in our unwillingness to ask for help. And we say, Lord, show us signs and wonders to point the way. To point the way, God. Thank you, Father, for this. We thank you for it today, Lord. And we decree it. And I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your back against you and breathe and feel your heart beat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. And I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. And I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. And this love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. 
I just, um, I felt like some of you have asked for a sign for healing. God, give me a sign. And, and John walked over me and said that Scott had some prophetic words for healing. So if you already asked for that, this is your chance. When words of knowledge come forth, in other words, God's given us information about your problem. <laughs> it's because it's on his heart to heal it. It's not just so, ooh, you know, Scott can hear from God or John, Tim can hear from God. It's about God who says, I heard your heart, and I want to heal it. I'm bringing it up right now. So that means there's healing in the room to get what you need for your breakthrough. So I'm going to let him share that. So pain right here in the left knee. Uh, I had pain in the left knee, and, and then I heard like a blowout. Uh, and that was also for the right knee. If, you, if you've blown your knee out, even if you've had surgery and you have metal in there, uh, the the Holy Spirit even told me that. Even if they have surgery and metal, uh, then that's one of them. Um, the right hip flexor area, kind of right here in the hip, where you bend down and you sit, I, I got a word of knowledge for that. I don't know if you have uh, it, it's something to do with your hip and the joint maybe or the muscle connected there. Um, one leg is shorter than the other, and you get back pain. That's another one. If you have a leg that's shorter or you kind of walk uh, with a, a little hobble, I got that with the right shin. If you have an issue with your right shin, and uh, years ago we prayed for a girl who had a tumor on her right shin. She wasn't even in the room. We prayed for her, uh, and that night when her mother went home, she woke up screaming, and uh, her tumor had completely disappeared. Um, left elbow, right here on kind of the inside of the left elbow. If you have any kind of issue, um, I don't know whether it's tendonitis or anything, uh, that one also. Uh, rib cage, something with the rib cage. Um, if you have maybe cartilage issues or something in your rib cage, uh, that's you too. So if that's you, just uh, real quick, just raise your hand if any of those connect with you at all, any of those. All right, we're going to go ahead and pray real quick. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you, Father. You are the healer. If you're around those, somebody has their hand up, put your hand on them right now. Let's let the body pray for these people. So they got their hand lifted, lay your hands on them right now. And we pray right now, Heavenly Father, to come, bring healing. We speak to all bodies, bodies aligned in the name of Jesus Christ. All pain leave in the name of Jesus Christ. All arthritis be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. All metal pieces be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. We just declare a return to the manufacturer, the warranty of the manufacturer, how the manufacturer designed and created you. you we're just calling a return uh, of bicy ligaments popping back into place. If you're feeling something right now, raise your hand above your head and wave, wave your hand above your head if you feel anything. If you feel any kind of uh, pressure or any kind of warmth on you, just let everybody know that you're feeling something. We just pray, Father, gallbladder issues. Gall if you're having issues with your gallbladder, we just pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. Gastritis, in the name of Jesus, we're just praying right now for healing of gastritis. Pancreas, if you're having issues with your pancreas. Thank you, Jesus. Um, dyslexia. And I see it's like you, you, you're you even having trouble uh, writing checks or reading checks because uh, you, you, your dyslexia messes with you. We just call right now for an alignment of the vision and the brain to connect, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I just testify when you get that healing. Sometimes we forget to testify about those healings. There's real anointing here to do that. I felt like at the end of the service, I didn't want to do it right now, but that back thing that we have one leg shorter than the other, um, we're going to pray for people like that this morning. And I think there's more than one of you like that. Some of you just having lower back pain. Some of you don't even know you have that problem. One way to find out is your pants, you know, guys, your pants, you're tore up on one side and not on the other, <laughs> on the bottom there, your hem, it's because you got one leg longer than the other. I've had, I've been healed of that, and uh, I didn't believe I was a skeptic, and a guy sat me down and prayed for me, and my muscle grew out, and I freaked out, and I repented, but, because uh, I didn't believe you could do that, uh, faith of man of God, I am, but, uh, 
I just want to say we're going to pray for people and their legs are going to grow out this morning because that's a lot of your back alignment. You just your, your spine's out of alignment, and we're going to straighten that out. So um, spiritual chiropractic today, we'll just do that here later at the end of the service. Okay. Father, we just now, we seal these healings, Lord, in the hearts of the people that they wouldn't lose it. They'd hold on to it. Lord, what they just felt, what they experienced. Lord, maybe some of it's not measurable at the moment, but Lord, let them stay in that faith that they had an encounter with you in this meeting. And the Lord, these words of knowledge were the sign that they needed that they're going to get healed. And Lord, you demonstrate your word today, manifested here today. Lord, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to get healed today. Amen? All right, you can be seated after you say that to somebody. All right, we got a... Show a quick video here. Hi, I'm Ronnie Floyd, and I'm the president of the National Day of Prayer. The National Day of Prayer mobilizes unified public prayer for America. And one of the expanding visions we have for the National Day of Prayer is to be a catalyst for a rhythm of united prayer throughout the year. For example, can you imagine after thousands and thousands of gatherings happen across the nation on the National Day of Prayer in the month of May, to come back together in July, really taking people through a longer journey and an experience personally of how to pray for our nation through the month of July, or when you look at October, how you could pray for pastors in the month of October through that month that has been designated as Pastor Appreciation Month. Or then you look at February. Think about what happens in February. It's about love and marriages and families as a part of a Valentine emphasis. Well, in partnering with Tony Perkins and the Family Research Council, as well as the Call to Fall Prayer Initiative that we have been involved in, we want to join in 31 days of prayer for our nation that begins on Sunday, July the 1st. Can you imagine that? All of us, all of our churches praying for 31 days in a row for our nation. And we do it personally in our individual prayer lives every day. Well, let me introduce you to a resource today. It's called 31 Days of Prayer for My Nation. It is used all along the way. And it's a compilation of a lot of different things relating to devotional articles and other things that our National Day of Prayer team has put together, as well as through all kinds of national leaders that you may know, like Sammy Rodriguez, Tom Phillips, Kay Horner, Tony Evans, Tony Perkins, Francis Chan, and perhaps even others. In fact, when you look into this long list of 31 days, I want you to think about this journey talking and teaching you why I pray for my nation, what to pray for my nation. Our nation is broken. Revival signs, extraordinary united prayer. I mean, the list goes on and on. So your life spiritually has a chance to grow in a month, quite honestly, where many Christians lag behind because of vacations and the hot summer days. But in the month of July, you can grow. And thousands and thousands and thousands of you can go forward in your faith, crying out to God for the Lord to heal our land in the month of July. Therefore, I want to ask you, would you go on this personal journey with us about praying for the nation for 31 days throughout the month of July? 
Only God knows where our country will be by then. We have seen disasters and tragedies and, and rumors of wars, and you've heard everything imaginable and seen much of it on television. We need to pray for our country. I'm telling you, our problems are not simply political, they're not simply sociological, but they are spiritual problems overall. And when we get the spiritual in line, we're going to be much better on how to deal with the rest of life. Would uh, Next week, we're going to do a call to fall with uh, churches all around America. I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of people will be praying next week. So we'll be joining them. But this is just an opportunity here. If you'll just go to the, uh, you can either go to call to fall or National Day of Prayer. And you can get that information on, on the, this 31 days of praying for our nation. Okay, I'm going to ask Jocelyn to come and announce about our kids camp. We have a special camp uh, that's really, uh, this may be one of our best camps ever as far as what I feel like God's up to, the supernatural that we're believing for uh, with um, IHOP minister coming. And so I want her to share that. And we need as many to sign up today as possible if we could. Um, I'm actually really excited to see the July prayer thing because I think I felt like God said July was going to be like a month, you know, for us. And I know we have the dome thing on the Friday before camp. So camp is um, July 22nd through the 24th. That's uh, four weeks from today, July 22nd. So we're starting on a Sunday afternoon. Um, let me see here. Let me get this right. Um, here. Where did I write this? Um, okay, Sunday is 5 to 8 p.m., and then Monday and Tuesday it's going to be 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, we need you to try to sign up today if you can. It's $40 per child today. After July 1st, it's going to go up to $50 per child, and um, the ages are 6 to 12 years old. If you want to volunteer to sign up, we have a volunteer sign-up sheet for you. It's out there on the table, and we also have registration forms. So after the service, you can sign up and pay for it. And let me see. I think, yeah, if you would like to sponsor a child for camp, see either me or Karen. So I think that's it. Oh, it's uh, Lenny LaGuardia from International House of Prayer in Kansas City. That's when we're speaking. All right. Thank you. I have Pancake change her name because this guy's coming here. Did y'all know that? No, no. Uh, but um, it, it's really powerful. And I think somebody here took their kids to that camp. Who was it? Told me that. Yeah, Trey did. Yeah, he's not here today. And yeah, wasn't it good? Yeah. Come on over here so everybody can hear you. Come. Trey's been. Th Trey took his son and drove all the way to Kansas City for. Uh, to hear this, you know, LaGuardia is in the ark, but he's uh, actually, his name's Lenny. And come here, tell, tell what, what, what y'all got out of the camp. This was a surprise. I didn't know I was going <laughs> to speak. Um, uh, yes, my, my, my son, when he was six, we took him the last two years there, and uh, it was a real blessing to our family. He came home last year, and he had a whole outline of what he was going to do, and he said, every Wednesday, Dad, I'm going to take one chapter of the Bible, and I'm going to preach on that chapter of the Bible every Wednesday morning. And he came home saying, here's, what I, here's other things I'm doing from, that I learned at the camp. And um, they had all the kids pray for anyone that wanted to be prayed for at the end of the camp each time. And uh, it was a super blessing. I mean, it was really worth um, any dollar we spent to get there and any time we spent to get there. I mean, we were tired driving back and forth, but we loved going to IHOP. And, of course, we loved, I love coming to church every time. So that's what's well now you don't have to drive to Kansas City. You can come to Shreveport. How about that? That's good. Amen. We're going to release our kids now, if you will, uh, ages 6 to 12, speaking of kids, whack today. And um, also, don't forget to pray through the, the dome, which is July 20. Everybody, please say July 20, July 20. It is a Friday night, and we canceled everything else in Shreveport that night. So uh, it's the only thing going on. And Chuck Pierce and his team is coming, and this is a prophetic word. If you would, on our Facebook page, or, and Chuck has actually posted on his Facebook page as well, there's a little button, if y'all aren't, uh, you know, savvy with that, just says share, 
if you will, what that does, it creates traction on, on the Internet. And the more shares they are, the more it gets spread out. So it's free advertising for us and to get it out because we want the entire region. We have Oklahoma coming, Arkansas is coming, Texas is coming uh, to fulfill this prophetic word. Chuck uh, had uh, 10 cities that he named in the prophecy that we're believing will be gathered here. And so we're going to praise through the dome. It's crazy. As soon as he gave that word, Susan and I were talking yesterday, um, Max and Isabella, uh, Hillary's uh, children were in a play at Centenary. We went and saw it. And it's just like, that's just one of them. I've been to Centenary like four times since uh, Chuck prophesied that just through different events that we went there, the Holocaust Remembrance Service, on and on. So I'm constantly on there. My son went swimming there, on and on, where God just keeps putting us on that campus. And uh, there's, there's, there's a reason that God wants us to break something there. And so please make uh, every effort to do that. We're going to need help because uh, it's a whole setup of doing a whole service there. Uh, so talk to Lindy when she gets back. Our team's down in uh, Austin. They've been at the President's Conference uh, with Rick Pino and them just getting whacked this week. And uh, so they'll come back uh, pumped up as well. So pray for the team as they drive back from Austin today. Okay. Um, Acts 3 Verses 19 through 21 says this, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How many of y'all need some refreshing? Not just because it's 180 degrees outside, but we need the refreshing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We do. And the only path to refreshing is repentance. And we did a sermon here uh, a while back. This is the third part of it about repentance and how that is a gift from the Father, that he gives us this gift of repentance, which then leads to faith, because you cannot have faith without the act of repentance. Because what you do when you repent is you're recognizing that he is the one that saves you and forgives you. So it takes faith, but it releases faith in you. And then the next step after that is faith leads to works. Because all works that are outside of faith are dead. But all the works that are of faith are life. And so this is a part. These are gifts. God gave us the gift of repentance. He gave us the gift of faith. He preordains the works for us. He already has works prepared for us. And he gives us the gift of grace. So your salvation by grace through faith is all a gift. Not just because he saves you, because he gave you the gift of grace and faith so that you could be saved. So far, when we look at the attributes of, of God giving us everything, none of it has been given as, is from us in ourselves. Everything that we have is from him. And so, therefore, there's no room for pride. And that's why God gave us these gifts so that we would never take credit for ourselves and try to be like God or create our own salvation. And that's what humanism is, and that's what the world system is, is we're going to save this world. We're going to save everything through human hands and human ways, human, human ways and, and political ways and whatever. Just, I'm, I don't know about you. I can't watch news anymore. How about y'all? Y'all, I don't know. I just, like, I got to get with Jesus and listen to the, the Holy Spirit rather than news because it is so distorted in so many different ways. And so many people are making judgments and comments, Christians alike, and they have no clue what they're talking about. Their reference points are from, from the media, which is hilarious. Uh, and in the sense that, that that would be your reference point. Your reference point has to be from on being on your face in repentance and God telling you what's going on. Let God speak to you what's happening in the earth. Other than that, I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to news and be lost. I'm just saying don't let that be your source of revelation. <laughs> Besides, it's not revelation anyway. <clears throat> it's condemnation. But anyway... So we, we have this whole thing where God says it will repent. We'll have this point of refreshing. And then he says that he may send Jesus Christ, the appointed one to you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times, from ancient time. Now, I want to say this over your life, over America, over the purposes of what God's doing. Uh, Jesus' patience is bound to his prophetic words. Jesus' patience is bound to his prophetic words. 
So when God has prophesied something over your life, his patience is bound to that prophecy, which means he's waiting until it's restored in your life. And he will wait even when you're functioning in the spirit of stupidity, even when you're functioning in selfishness and humanism and all your issues, he is still patient because he's bound to his prophetic word. Now, if it doesn't come to pass, it's not because of his impatience. It's bound, it doesn't happen because of your disobedience (laughs) and maybe your impatience. Uh, That you couldn't wait for God any longer. So you wanted to hurry up the process. Okay, today I want to talk about, I want to unpack, you know, the revelation of how you have a chance to make all the right choices. And it's about faith to works, but because these works that you do are really works or choices that you make because you feel like you should do them or they're the right thing to do. But I, there's a way in God to always make the right choice. People make wrong choices in marriages. They make wrong choices in jobs. They make ra- wrong choices in relationships. They make wrong choices in financial dealings. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I could, we could all write a book on that, right? Wrong choices. But we see the life of Christ never once did he make a wrong choice. Never once. And he had a lot of choices to make. And yet every time he had an answer on how to do the right thing. And that answer is available to all of us. And it's a pattern that will lead us to the glory. It is a pattern that God laid out for us. And I want to unpack that today, especially about getting into the headship and lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. Because I'm tired of making bad decisions. Here's how most people make decisions. They, they, in, if they don't do it naturally, do it in their mind, they get a list of pro and cons. Okay, should I move here? Well, the schools are better there. I'll make more money. The weather's better. I'm gone. <laughs> or uh, pros and negative is I'll be away from my family. I'll da, 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 you know, have all these lists. And then they make decisions based on that. How many of us make decisions? We've all made decisions like that. That's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because that's what was offered at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You'll be able to choose what is good and what is bad is. And then you can make your own choice and you'll be like, your, be like God. And so you are weighing out situations based on that rather than going to the tree of life, which is Christ, who has the answer to whether you should move or not. Because if he says don't move, all the pros and cons don't matter. Or if he says do, do move, all the pros and cons don't matter. Because it's what he wants. And he says, when you eat of that tree, surely you shall live. And if you eat of the other tree, he says, surely you shall die. So you can move on pros and cons and not be God, and you will die in that place. Or you can go there, and he says, yes, go there, and then it's, you're going to live, then you're going to thrive there. Okay, so this is the choice that we have. We have all these choices in life. And we have a source in us that can always help us make the right choice. So I want to go through just a scriptural uh, journey here real quickly. i got to run up here so you don't have to go through your Bible. Uh, but I, I'd encourage you to go watch this afterwards but, so you'll have the scriptures. But Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, he said he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I love the beauty that all of Christ can be in all of us. That we don't have to be lacking anything. But he's the head. We're going to start there today, the headship of Jesus Christ. He is the head. I I thought about it. I wished I could have done this, have somebody dress up with no head and then walk in here today. You know, wouldn't that be cool to watch? And somebody there. Now, what would a person with no head, if they could actually live, and I don't think you can physiologically, but if they would, they would have no clue where they're going. They'd run into things everywhere, and it would just be chaos in their entire life. Sounds familiar. (laughs) I hope I didn't just describe your life. But I want you to know, if he's not your head, you're walking around 
with a headless body. And the majority of the church function just like that. They have somebody tell them, walk this way, do this, do this. They have some sort of sensing or hearing. But they don't have, they aren't tied to the head. But he's head, not over some things, but he's head over, uh-oh. Can you allow him to be head over everything? Because, you know, a lot of people think we're too spiritual, us spirit-filled people anyway. Because you just have to ask Jesus for everything. Why don't you just use your brain and do it? I've been told that so many times. You know, I'm not saying you should get up in the morning and say, you know, do I go to the potty now? You know, I'm not saying that, you know. But there are times you walk in your closet <clears throat> and you say, what do I wear today? You know, and, and I, I've done that before. I, I went to a meeting once and I, Lord, I said, Lord, what do I wear tonight? And Lord said, wear that blue shirt. I said, okay, I wear a blue shirt. And I went and the prophet prophesied and he gave a word to me, another pastor, and he said, Lord gave me a dream last night. I said, there'll be two pastors here, one wear a blue shirt and one wear a brown. You're the pro you have the blue shirt on. The Lord says, you're going to have a prophetic church. And da, 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 da. Everything we're doing today was prophesied back in the 1990s from me wearing a blue shirt. Because I just asked him, do you want me to want, what do you want me to wear today? Because he's head of all things. And I don't do that every day. I probably should. My wife would be happy if I did. Why are you wearing that? Anyway. Okay. <laughs> OCD. Here we go. Next verse. All right. Uh, uh, Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. As a result, we are no longer children tossed here and there by the waves and carried by uh, every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of man, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So he's the head. So if you're being tossed about, to and fro. There's a reason because you aren't tied to the head. And so that doesn't give you an excuse to walk away from wise leadership and wisdom that's around you. Oh, good, I don't need anybody. I'll just be tied to Jesus. I'll be the lone ranger for Jesus. And there's a lot of people out there. But God, Paul also tells the fivefold is to assure you that you don't get tossed to and fro. So our job in ministry is to make sure that we're staying in doctrine that you're on the right line, that you have a way to get tied to the head. And so we, we hear from the head, and we tell you what we think the head's saying, and then you get in tied with that, and then you start walking in this headship with Jesus. He's the head over all things that we're doing, and we grow in him in all things when he's the head. And this is the process that we're in right now. Next, for, next scripture, Colossians 1.18. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning he is the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come and have first place in everything. Huh. Do you understand why you've made bad decisions? It's because of that last sentence right there. You understand why some of you today are in a bind? It's not because God wasn't faithful, and because people are mean to you, or because you got put in a bad situation. It's because Probably he was in first place in everything in your life. Now, remember, he's patient in your stupidity. And so while you're not allowing him to be first, he's not freaking out. He said, well, they'll learn. <laughs> and he is allowing you to go through the process so that he finally becomes first. So that you can always make the right choice. And your bad choices can be just a positive when you say, that wasn't God. I didn't make him first in my life. I need to go back and recalibrate here. That got me in a bind last time. What about now? And in that same book, Colossians is one of the best books. We just finished it in our men's Bible study. It's one of the best books on the supremacy and headship of Christ. There's no other better epistle or gospel in the, in the Bible about that. But in Colossians 2 18 and 19, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied, held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. So he's the head, 
We hold fast to the head. His entire body is being supplied and held together by the head. That's just Christ. Now, it says, I love this verse here in verse 18. You know, people have these visions. The Lord told me this. The Lord told me that. They, they have these ideas that I'm going to be prosperous here. I'm going to do whatever. They're, 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 they're these inflated ideas. I don't know. When my little boys were little, there's a place here. I don't know if it's still here down on the boardwalk. It's called uh, Build the Bear. You know what Build the Bear is? Everybody know what that is? And it's a little place, and they have all the supplies for building a bear. And you pick out the skin. or well, not skin. What do you call it? Fur or whatever. <laughs> you pick the way it looks and da 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 and, and then the little child gets to build it. He gets to put it together, put the stuffing in it, and he gets his little bear. And that's how some people pr- build prophetic words. They look on the, the shelves of prophecy or, or things that could happen in their life, and I want that, I want that, I want that. I had a vision of that. And then they go stuffing, but it's just full of stuffing. And they say, here's my destiny. And I said, really? And it's because that's what they wanted it to look like. And that's what this scripture says. You're standing on visions that you've seen. You're inflated with your fleshly mind. That's why I want to hear God clearly what I'm supposed to do in life. I want him to be the very joint, the ligaments. Think about that. They're supplied by the head. Uh, Dr. God, uh, Dr. Magali come up here and just talk about physiology and how the brain tells the body what to do and how it functions. And without it, nothing works. You, you ready, Doc? Get ready. Every member of the body must be connected to the head. <laughs> No human person or a teacher or a minister should be between you and the head. I remember Abraham Lincoln was trying to find God. He, didn't, he wasn't a Christian, and he would try in all the different denominations and religions. And, and I, remember, uh, I remember one thing he said. He, went to, he was in Mexico City. He went to a Catholic church, and so he thought maybe he'd be a Catholic and went in there and listened and asked to sit with the priest and for all that. And they said, well, so, sir, will you be a Catholic now? And he said, no, I will not. He said, I don't want a middleman. <laughs> he said, I want to talk to God directly. And the priest, sometimes in the Catholic Church, ends up being the voice of God to a person. I'm not saying we can't counsel as leaders, as priests. But the fact is, you need to be connected. And that's where that connection. I'm not trying to create a group of rebel, rebels here. Because you still need leadership. You still need people speaking into your life. But our goal as ministers is to guide you so that you can be connected to the head. Let me tell you what. As a pastor, your li- my life gets a lot easier when you're connected to the head. Because all you people running out headless, and you cause me a lot of problems. You fill my couch. You spend my days in prayer and crying out. I understand you need help. I need intercession. I understand it works. But the fact is... In my life gets a lot easier. You know, when we started teaching inner healing in this congregation, my, our, our counseling load just started going down and down and down because why? We told people how to connect with the head. And the more you can connect, the more answers you can get without looking to man. Okay. <laughs> what does the head do for the body? I'm not a doc or anything like that. But, you know, there's requests that the body makes of the head. If the hand wants to do something, it asks the head, please, I need to move this way. I want to pick this up. The head speaks to the hand. But here's the thing. When the head starts doing that, it makes these decisions. It acts on the request of the body, but it acts on behalf of the entire body. And that doesn't mean that the decisions that the head makes, the rest of the body likes. So when the hand wants to pick up some heavy weight, the backs of her going, uh-uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But the brain says, you're going to do it. And the back has to kick in and participate with picking up that weight. And if we have independent people in the body, and God says, do this, and the people that are the backbone of the body say, I ain't doing that. That tells me they're not connected to the head. Because if they're connected, we're all going to do this thing together. Boom, shakalaka, all right? I just put that right there. That's my, y'all had to be here on Wednesday to get that one, all right? So it doesn't mean that. After decisions are made, the head directs all what to do. It's telling 
If you could look at the neurological system in the natural body, it, there's, it's just like it's flying. Everything is flying because everything's being told what to do in order to accomplish a task. And after initiating the action, there's still going ongoing direction. It supervises the decisions the head has made. Everything's going on. It's constant. You don't understand how much happens in one movement. And you may not understand what God's up to, but you just need to flow with what the head is saying. Amen? So, let's talk about government in our lives. First of all, the kingdom of God is not democracy. And I think that is filtered in the church in such a way, because we think the American way is the best way, but it is not. <laughs> and the kingdom is not a democracy. Do you make your decisions based on democracy? Uh, let's see, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? You know, and then we come up with an answer. There are five basic different governments in the earth. Here they are. Number one is monarchy. Monarchy is one good man ruling. That's what monarchy is, or a king, if we see that. And then the second one is aristocracy, which is a rule of a few good men. Then we get democracy, the rule of the people. And of all governments, this is the weakest form of government. There's no weaker form in, 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 a, in, a, in a decent government, I should say. Uh, Plato, which I, you know, I read a lot of. But Plato said, <laughs> no, I don't. Plato said this. He said, if pastry cooks and doctors had to compete for the votes of children, who would get the most votes? <laughs> And that's what politicians do. They're pastry cooks. And they're offering you sweet things if you just vote for them. What if our politicians were truthful in their campaigning? <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I'm going to Washington. It's a quagmire. I probably won't be able to do anything for four years. Vote for me. You know, this thing is just stuck. Ain't nobody can do anything. Vote for me. So what do they tell you? They're going to change Washington. All right, so. And then the oligarchy, which is the rule of a few bad men, and tyranny is the rule of one bad man. And we see all those in the earth, right? The Bible gives us one government, which is one good man, our one true God ruling. That's what he says. John Wimber, who uh, ran a vineyard ministry before he passed away, they asked him about government one time. What kind of government do you have in your denomination, your church? He didn't call it denomination. It was a massive movement. He said, I am a benevolent dictator. And you know what? He was. He was not a controlling, manipulative man. He just had a heart to advance the kingdom of God. And he was benevolent. He loved people. He was merciful. But he was a dictator. How many of y'all could handle that? Oh, my God, we need to vote on him. <laughs> we want to interject democracy. How about he was changing the world with signs, wonders, and miracles, and see the rest of the body doesn't like that. So God's doing all this through this man and his ministry, and the rest of the body, uh -uh, I'm not agreeing with that. Mm. Yeah, that, didn't, that went out like a rat sandwich. Let me move forward. All right. He is... He is wonderful, though, in his monarchy. The Father functions that way. He also moves in aristocracy because he allows us a portion to rule with him as long as we still see him as king. The minute we don't see him as king, aristocracy is out the window. <laughs> Are you all there? You didn't know you were an aristocrat, did you? Look at your neighbor and say, I am royalty. <laughs> say that, I am royalty. And you are if he's the king. Okay? So, most churches and ministries, I, you can just, I've seen this in my whole lifetime, have, more of them have been destroyed by democracy, which is a Grecian philosophy that's based on humanism. That's what democracy is. 
I remember Rob Parsley said once he does a newcomer's class. And after newcomer's class, he tells the vision of the church, how it's run, what's going to happen there. And he said at the end, he said, if you agree with that, everything I just said, and you're going to be a part of this ministry, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to vote for that. And they all voted. And he said, now look at your hand. And everybody looked, and he says, that's the last time you ever vote in this church. I'm not trying to build a, I'm not that type of a guy anyway. Uh, I'm, I get in trouble for not, not ruling. But there's a whole thing about that when God puts somebody in charge of something, you've got to trust that's who God put there. It, what if God gave you somebody as a boss you didn't want to be a boss? What if that was God? Deal with your flesh. Well, y'all don't like that either. All right. So, in the end times, the path of the Antichrist spirit, or the plan of the Antichrist spirit in the last days, is going to rise up because people don't want to rule with Christ. But they want a human to make all decisions for them. That's how it's going to rise up. That's why we long for his headship in all spheres of society. We were driving here today, and... Uh, Susan and I were, and she's showing me something, these cars that drive by themselves. You understand what that's all about? That is an antichrist spirit. <laughs> because they want to tell you where to go, when to go, what road to be on. They want to tell you all of that. So all you do is chill. Some guy was doing that yesterday, and he killed somebody. He had a self-driving car, and he's watching TV in his car, and he hit a pedestrian. But it's a whole thing about controlling. You're going to let the world control your car, your life? Be a rebel in that area, all right? <laughs> the government. Anyway, <clears throat> in a sense, it's a picture of our car, our ministry, is that we want God to be the head. You understand the kicker is he lets us drive. We just go where he tells us to go. And we get to enjoy the ride. I promise you he's going to take you to good places. 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. So let's put this in sequence here, divine order. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of the wife. So we have this divine order that the Lord put here. It starts in heaven and it ends on earth. That's where it starts and ends. And the government is by headship. All headship. All government is by headship if it's proper. In the book of Revelation and Daniel, we see stories about creatures with multiple heads, you know, dragon-like creatures, whatever. But I want to say this. None of them are from God because God doesn't create anything with more than one head. Anything with more than one head or more than a, a many-headed creature is a monster. Just put that in your theological oven and cook it. Think about where that fits in life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if somebody's not taking their rightful role and we have multiple heads, we have chaos and we have created monsters. Wow. Lock the doors. Okay, God the Father is the head of Christ, right? That's what it just said here. The Father receives Input from Christ, the Son. In other words, Jesus would ask the Father, what do I do in this situation? Where do I go? What's the action here? Then the Father makes the decisions and initiates the actions. The Father gives ongoing direction then. So once the Father says do this, you can be guaranteed that once you start doing that, he's going to keep telling you stuff. It's not like, go for it, bro, <laughs> and then he leaves you. You know, go to India. God bless you. I had somebody once, this old story, they got translated supernaturally to South Africa, I mean South America, but they didn't have their passport and they had to walk back. But I'm telling you, you ever think about that being translated? I want to make sure I get a return ticket. But uh, <clears throat> it's a picture of that God wants to, he, I don't know why, that story has nothing to do with what I just said. But I want to go where, where he goes for us, and he keeps giving us the answers. And this is how Jesus lived on the earth. Let me give you a scripture for this, John 5, 19 and 20. Therefore, Jesus answered and saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself 
unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, and he shows him all. Everybody say all. All things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. If you want to do greater works, then you've got to know what the Father's doing. So the, the, here's the picture here. It says there in that verse 19, the Son can do nothing of himself. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth who says, I can do nothing of himself. But yet Christians and us today, many of us today, do not have that same attitude. We still do stuff of ourselves all the time. Think about the arrogance that that speaks in the spirit realm. So it says there, the Father loves the Son and so forth. So he, nothing of himself, Jesus does. And so the only, what the Father initiates, I want you to take that word right now, what the Father initiates, that's what you're to do. And we have no evidence in Scripture that Jesus did anything outside of what the Father initiated. None. That sounds like binding, but that's, it's really, it's a joy to wake up and to know that he has your good in mind. That he wants you to be successful. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to do well in life. And he's just going to take you on this journey where it's going to be just a blast. That's why it says here you're going to do greater works if you follow him. So he initiates nothing, nothing in himself. And the Father initiates everything. Here's another verse, John 5, 30. It says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, here's a kicker here. It, it, it's not only true that he just did what the Lord said to do, but even in his judgments, he was just. Because why? He was hearing the judge, judgments from the Father. So when he said to the Pharisees, you whitewashed men, that was a judgment from the Father. Wouldn't that be nice to hear that guy? Oh, good, I get to rebuke somebody. Because he's got the word in you, and you can begin to speak it with confidence that knows when you speak a direct word, it came from the Father. And the Father wouldn't do anything to harm but to set people free and to liberate people. And God was trying to speak things to the Pharisees to awaken them. Even in their sin, their judgments were pure and they were just because God was trying to wake them up. So he functioned in perfection. His choices were perfected. So when he came up on a scene of a sick person, he came up on a scene of a, a demonic person, whatever, he looked in the Spirit and he saw what the Father was saying, what the Father was doing, and he asked the Father, what, what should I do? That's the input to the head. The head hears the input and then says, okay, here's what you do. You speak to that demon. You pray for that sick person or you walk away from this situation. Or you do this or you do that. You understand how I'm starting to make right choices now? But usually most of us are compulsive. We have inner issues that we've not been delivered of called bitterness, anger, frustration, impatience. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da. And his perfection can't work in us because it has a block. It's called you. It's called me. And so as a father who is perfect in Christ, that could function perfectly. And so that's where we have to be. It's unwise for us to make our own judgments. Mm -hmm. We could do a whole month's series on that. But we should wait and hear what the Lord has to say on those issues. How many times have you got yourself into those binds? <laughs> because you impulse, you jumped in there. If you can't hear God, then you need to hang around people who can and begin to learn from them how to hear God, how to get counsel. Not that they'll tell you what to do, but they'll help you how to hear God. That's what we do here. If you want to say what Christian Center does, the main thing we want to do here is teach people how to hear God. Because I know if you can hear God, you're tied to the head. If you're tied to the head, you're going to make right decisions. You're going to make right decisions. You're going to change the world. <laughs> and so that's our goal. Yeah, we can help you make decisions, yes. But ultimately, you've got to be able to make the children your, your own decision. You do that for children until they can make their own decisions. If you let your five-year-old tell you where he wants to eat every day, where do you think he's going to tell you? <laughs> he's 
God, you'll die from McDonald's, right? So you, you have to say, look, you don't have the cognitive ability. So what do we do? We teach our children to make right choices, right? How to hear properly. Think about this process. So one of the best things you can do is teach your children how to hear God. I used to do that for my kids all the time. God, I want, Dad, I want to do this and this and this. I said, well, you need to ask Jesus. Now, I knew the answer to their question, but I was trying to teach them how to ask the Lord. Mm hmm Yeah. I once, Jacob, he wanted to go on this trip. Uh, youth were going to, to, um, to um, Dallas for something anyway. So I have a dream. And in the dream, he would go there, and he'd fall. He'd get hung around this one kid in the youth group in the dream, and they got caught stealing something in the store, and my son got arrested, da-da-da. That was what the dream was. And so I didn't want to tell him the dream because he wanted to go on this trip. I want to be a mercy dad, and my wife's a prophet, so she says, you better tell him. <clears throat> and so I didn't want to tell him. <laughs> so I was getting close to the date, and, and the, spirit of Susan, uh, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, and she said, you better tell him. <laughs> and so, because I taught my children to trust what the Lord says, I went in one night, and I said, son, I had a dream, and I tell him the dream. And he started crying. He's like 13. And I said, what's wrong, son? He goes, I know what this means. I said, what? He goes, I can't go on the trip. <laughs> I said, that's right. But he had learned that God was protecting him. And on that trip, that young man I had the dream about went into a store and stole something and got caught. Because he's head over all things. And little things like that he'll protect us from, even though the rest of the body doesn't want to do it. The body, his body wanted to go to Dallas. The spirit said stay in Shreveport. Thank you. There's one dad. So she is. All right. So it takes humility and patience. I'm with you, Jason. To wait on the Lord's judgments for the answers to life. Without him as a head, you have no chance of making the right decisions. Don't judge your decision being right just because you prospered. Hello. John 14, 10. Do not believe. I'm sorry. Do, do you be not believe that I am the fa in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Wow. Everybody look at that. Isn't that good? So who is the source? The Father's the source. Father works in us. So works he did was the, Jesus did, was the Father dwelling in Christ. That's the definition of lordship or headship in your life. That's the pattern to the glory. So after the resurrection in John 20, 21, Jesus said this. So Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. So what he was saying is the same pattern that Jesus followed, we should follow. So the same pattern Jesus lived in, we should do the same. Jesus said the works that he did, the Father was living in him. So the works that we do should be Christ living in us. Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. We should say the same. When people look at us, should they see us or should they see Jesus? That shouldn't get many amens because that's a tough one, isn't it? But if he is the head of all things in your life, you can be assured that when you do stuff, it's him being seen. Even if the people don't like it. See, you judge that you did the right thing by the response of people, especially if your love language is affirmation. Whew. You people need a lot of work in that area. If that's your love language, affirmation, you're going to have a hard time that way. Uh, others, you have your own issues. <laughs> the other love language, you have other issues. So the pa same pa pa uh, pattern that Jesus lived under, we should do the same, right? Are you all with me on that? Let's, let's talk about Jesus being over the head of the church, and then we're going to close. For, for, um, uh, it's, in, it's in Ephesians 5, 23. I didn't have the slides. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, so he himself being the Savior of the body. So what's that mean? Jesus receives input from the church. In other words, we have requests. We, we, we ask the Lord, what do we do in this situation? We need solutions. And so what do we do? We go to the head for solutions. Most of the issues of life is because we have instituted the wrong government in our lives. 
we're, we're in tyranny or a democracy or we're in some of those false governments and we're functioning that way and we've not asked God for that help. It's the very thing that John just prophesied here this morning. Ask for a sign. If you don't have the answer, you need to ask for a sign. Well, I did ask for a sign. Well, ask for another one. Maybe you didn't like the sign he sent. Remember, answered no is also answered prayer. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. Jesus makes decisions for the church, and we are not called to do that. Jesus initiates actions for the church. He gives ongoing direction, the whole pattern of the head. So we are responsible to follow these commands and these initiatives. And is that occurring today? I mean, can we say that? John Wimber once did a sermon called, Jesus, he said, Jesus asked this question. He made this statement, I want my church back. <laughs> and therein lies a problem because the church has been able to function without Jesus for a long time as not being head. And we need to let him be the head of the church in everything that we do. So we're lost without hope, without Jesus doing this for us. And, and our failure and our damnation is based on him not being head. So then we, 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 we can become arrogant and try to become the head and start telling Jesus how to run the church, run our lives, how to deal with others. Now think about this. Jesus took us. We were, we were dirt bags. We were nothing. You were a dirt bag. Did you know that? Just you were out of the dirt. You were nothing. He, in a sense, picked you up when he picked up Adam out of that dirt, <laughs> breathed life into you, gave you substance, gave you purpose, gave you authority, gave you all this stuff in life, blessed you, got saved, got set free, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, got all this stuff. And after you've been in the kingdom for a little while, you start looking around and saying, I can, I can run this place. I can tell that church what to do. I, those people, that church over there, da 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 Where did we come from? We were nothing. And now we are saying we are the monarchy. And we're going to tell that. Now let me tell you, you criticize somebody's children, whoo, I've met more mama bears in my lifetime in church. You say something about their child, oh, my gosh. I'm surprised I still have eyes. They scratched them out. So what do you think the father's response is when you start criticizing his kids? See, a parent doesn't want you to criticize their children because you haven't been there with that child. You didn't have to deal with them all their lives, those nights walking them around the room, those nights having to spank them, those nights of loving on, those nights of suffering with them, and then you want to talk bad about them. <laughs> Y'all didn't like that. Because you're all guilty. Look at your neighbor and says, you're guilty. Look at him right now. Tell him you're guilty. And so am I. We're all guilty of this. So let's just repent and say we're going to stop doing that. Now, there's one thing about speaking when somebody's a false prophet or a false teacher. We have a responsibility to judge that. But when we're criticizing people just to criticize them, the father is very angry about that. And I want to be really careful. If he's the head, he loves all parts of the body. Hmm. Somebody has to be the rear, okay? <laughs> That's a nice word, isn't it? I could use the Bible word, but, you know, somebody's going to be that. But they have a purpose in the body, all right? <laughs> the Lord will be faithful. I want to say this. Um, uh, there's a, this is a, verse, a very important verse here. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of water life without cost. What is he saying here? He says, If I am not the Alpha, I will not be the Omega. In other words, if I didn't start this thing, don't look to me to finish it. If you made choices in your life without letting him be the head, and then you want him to fix your mess, he's, he says, if I'm the alpha, then I'm the omega. He didn't say, if you're the alpha, I'm the omega. Jesus said this, that it was spirit of spirit, that was flesh is flesh. Ishmael would have never turned into Isaac as hard as Abraham and Sarah tried to make it happen. 
They couldn't pray hard enough, hard enough for that child to become the son of promise because it was not from the Alpha. The Lord did not create Ishmael for that purpose. And so many things in your life are self-created. How many Ishmaels do you have in your household? Hopefully you don't have an orphanage. But I'm telling you, we've produced a lot of things in our life that were never from the head. So what do we do with them? We're fighting uh, Ishmael and, uh, and Isaac today. I was just in Israel, you know, uh, in October. I remember we were in a village we were staying at, and right across was all the Is Ishmaelites. And I'm thinking, I looked at Abraham. I said, this is a 4,000-year mistake. Hmm. See, some of your decisions, when you don't go to the head, can have generational effects. So why don't we just stop and say, I want to hear from you. Hebrews 12, 2, I'm about done. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher or the perfecter of our faith. So he's responsible to perfect, listen to me, what he begins. If he began it, he's responsible to restore it and to make it happen. So you need to chill out about all these things you don't think God's answering prayer to. If he birthed it, he's going to bring it to fruition. Can you say this verse right here? Philippians 1, 6. For I am confident of the very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. See, if you are sure God birthed something, you have confidence that he's going to perfect it. But if you're not sure he birthed it, your confidence is low and you struggle. Now, sometimes you may have heard the Lord and maybe not, but many times you don't have. So I want confidence. And this is the difference between good and perfect. What are the works in your life going to look like at the end of the age? And John and I were talking about this today. The most abundant thing in all the earth is wood, hay, and stubble. Think about the world. Look it over. Wood, hay, and stubble is everywhere. It's the most abundant thing. What's, what's the least abundant thing? Precious stone. Costly gold. Silver. And that's the difference between good works and dead works. Dead works are abundant. There's hay, wood, and stubble. Dead works are everywhere. There's plenty to do. But what if the Father's not saying do them? See, one precious stone is worth more than stacks of wood, hay, and stubble. So you're measuring your works by how many you're doing when he's measuring it by the beauty of what you're doing. And if you're doing what he says, they're beautiful. Let's stand up. I only lost about 20 during the service, so I did okay. You saw them leave, didn't you? I took, I took their names. No, I know some of them had, they had family things, I know. That's what they told me. <laughs> and I'm asking you this question. Are your works of faith initiated by the Lord? Is he the head? If they are, they're precious to him. And this is a verse that we all need to live by. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And, it, and here's what the last part of the, that, that verse is so important. In whatever he does, he prospers. Another word there you could put is he's successful. You can have guaranteed success and always have a chance to write the, make the right decision. My question to you today is, who are you getting counsel from? The head? Or do you have some form of government that you've created in order to make decisions in life? What works to do, what you should do in life, where you should live, who you should marry, so forth, on and on. 
And right here in this communion table, the bread of life, Christ says, if you'll eat of me, you'll never hunger again. If you'll drink of me, you'll never thirst again. Hunger for knowledge, hunger for answers. Here it is. He's got the answer. The church is a mess right now as a whole, and especially in America. There's a pastor who put out a book recently called Quit Church. <laughs> and he said he's encouraging people to quit church. It's kind of a gimmick to sell the book, but because he's not telling you to leave the church. He's just quit doing it the way we've been doing it. But he quoted some stats as in Fox News yesterday. And he said this, only 39% of active believers consider the Bible to be the literal word of God. Less than 20% of professing believers follow the biblical principle of giving. And it says only 5% have shared their faith with a non-believer. And more than half of the church members attend church once a month or less. That's the state of the church in America right now. That's where we are. We need the head to come back and be in charge. Jesus says, I want my church back. (laughs) And I want to lead it. And I want to lead it into breakthrough. And here it is in this bread. And we can all repent for that. Something's got to change, and it's us. God changes not. (laughs) Well, God, you need to do it this way. No, he doesn't. You need to change. I need to change. I need to trust the Lord. And so right now, just bow your head. I want to pray over you. Thank you all for listening. Forgive me if I did any carnal stuff there. I'm sure I did a couple things. But I want you to challenge your heart. Do you believe the word of God? Don't be that 39% don't believe the literal word of God. Are you faithful in what he tells you to do? Your giving, your, not only just your finances, but your life. Have you surrendered your life fully to him? My greatest fear today would be that as a pastor, I pastored you every week and only to find out in eternity you didn't know him. And I would have your blood on my hands because I didn't tell you truth. You should be convicted today in areas of your life that you've not allowed him to be head. And I want you to begin to believe for his headship in your life. So you can make the right choices in life. And so, Lord, we repent. Let's do this as a body. If you're willing, I know it's corny sometimes, but if you just repeat after me. And and just mean, don't just say it just because pastor is making you say it. If you desire to repent of this, I think there can be a breakthrough here today. This key that's here today. And so repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Forgive me, and I repent of not letting you be the head in all things in my life. Hmm. Is that a long enough prayer? I think it is. (laughs) Don't muck this thing up. Keep it simple. And now, Lord, I surrender to you as head. Now, that's going to be another prayer. That you're going to have to pray and just believe that he can become head. I don't have the strength. He'll give it to you. I have fear. He'll remove it. I can't trust. He'll help you. (laughs) Every excuse you have, he has an answer. And I want to speak his patience over you and his prophetic destiny over your life. The reason God has not killed you or allowed the devil to kill you is because what's written about you in Psalms 139, 16. All the days of your life are written in a book. And he is being long-suffering and patient toward you because he wants you to fulfill your script. That's the loving God we serve. (laughs) So you're looking at your failures. He's just looking at wasted time and says we can make up for it. So I speak restoration of time. It's like it says in Joel. He restores the years that the locusts that I birthed (laughs) have created. 
the locusts that the enemy sent, he says, I'm going to restore years. I'm just seeing this prophetically right now. There's some of you, you're 10 years behind schedule. Some of you are five. I saw tens and fives. Because you made your own choices and you went down a path that led you to where you are today. And I saw the Lord put you on a fast track to begin to make up years and begin to restore to you years. And the Lord said the joy that you will experience in the restoration will far outweigh the pain of the loss that you created through a failed decision. That's greater joy like Job had. His latter days are better than his former. I decree that right now over this house, over the Christian Center, over Shreveport, over this purpose of this city. We decree that we have got off track, but we're getting back on track. And, Lord, we're going to restore years and bring this city back into its rightful place. Mosier, this whole region is coming back into its rightful place. If, if God prophesied it, he's patient until it's fulfilled. And he is the omega of the alpha words that are over your life and over our communities. He birthed them. He's responsible for them. Let them go, the Lord says. The Israelites wandered in the desert because of unbelief. Come out, enter into the rest of the Lord, and say, Lord, they're your prophecies anyway. <laughs> just relinquish them back to him. Quit trying to make them happen and just say, God, they're your prophecies. I'm going to be absorbed with them. I'm going to believe for them, but they're yours. And, I, Lord, you told me I'd do this. You told me we'd walk like this. You told my family would be this way. I give them back to you now, Lord. They're yours. They're your prophecies. And so we put our faith in you, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And we ask for the Omega anointing to begin to hit our families, to hit our prophecies, to hit our purposes in the earth. We just release that. And he is faithful and he is just to do what he said he's going to do. His word will not come back void. That's a word over somebody here today. I break that lie that says it's void, it's, it's without form. That is a lie. The Lord said it, is, it does not come back to me that way. So I decree that right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to take your offering right now. Let's, let's do this. You know, the, the, the opportunity to give, I love to give. I just love it. Because he told me to do it. I am giving today because God told me to do it a long time ago. And I want to say that to you. Um, and I've been teaching this on Wednesday nights, but I want to release this to those who have not been able to come. Some of you have a vision from the past that you wrote down and you've been believing for or it's in your heart. I encourage you to write it down. And when you wrote it down and when you received it, you had faith. But today you don't have faith for it. Because so much time has gone by. And the Lord spoke to me, and I released this the other night. The Lord said the faith that was on it when you wrote it down and believed for it can be moved forward. And you can actually still be in somewhat of a doubt today, but the faith that was on it then can live today. Hmm. And we told the story in 2 Kings 4 to prove that scripture. A woman believed for a son, but she was doubting it. But she had believed for it, and because her faith was there when she believed for it, she had a son. And I want to speak that to you right now. If there's an old dream, God says if you had faith on it, it's coming forward. You paid it forward. It's here now. So I speak to old dreams, and I speak life on them. Some of you need businesses, opportunities. And as soon as you sow today, I want you to believe for that. We're going to open the communion table, and we're going we're gonna to give our offerings today. So, Father, I thank you right now as we sow and we give. We take this bread and this communion here, which represents your body and what you did. And you're the source of life. And I can do all things through you. Be the head of my life. And even in my finances, in my family, in every area of my life. I pray that for everybody here today. Father, I decree it now as we sow. We sow in faith. And with grace here today, we ask you to pour out on us. In Jesus' name, here we go, guys. All right, now.
told you we're going to do this at the end of the service. This front row where Susan's sitting is going to be reserved for leg lengthening. <laughs> I, I know what's going to happen. John, you come with me, and, and Scott, you're going to have to participate as well. And we're going we're gonna to just do this. We're going to make you sit there, and we're going to hold your legs out, and we're going to pray. And we're going to see miracles today. All right? Why not? Why not? He said he's going to do it. He's the head of all things, and that's what he said. So if you've been having lower back problems, maybe your leg's not like that. We'll pray for just your back. But if you're having problems like that, we want to do this. I, I feel faith for it. I hope you do, John. Yeah. Earlier when the word came about uh, the different uh, things, the healing for the different things, I'd had this burning pain in my elbow. And um, I just, when I had my hands up, my left hand started getting warm. And I've noticed I have no more burning pain in my elbow. So. Amen. There's your sign, your wonder. You ask for a sign. Come take communion. Y'all, come on. Get your communion, sow in your offering. And then those that need prayer are here. We want to pray for your healing. Also, fathers, if you were here, weren't here last week, we got our Father's Day gift for you. Uh, Stephen over here has that for you if you weren't here last week. We want to bless you, dads, uh, as, as that way. So, okay. All right. I'm ready for a breakthrough. Throw some Holy Ghost anointing worship on there.